welcome everyone to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton, the series director, and today we present Cuban American artist and illustrator Idel Rodriguez. Uh, yay! He's an exciting guy. He's got a great story, and you're going to enjoy it. And he's got some really bold and no stranger to controversy work for you. Uh, a thank you to our partners for their support today, uh, the Institute for the Humanities and AIGA Detroit, and our series partner, Arts Engine. Believe it or not, this is our last event of the fall season. We have just like, whoo, it's been such a whirlwind. Yeah. Uh, and Thanksgiving is so late this year, so uh, we actually, we, we, we will return to you though uh, in 2020, January 16th, we will be back here uh, with Oscar Eustace uh, from the Public Theater in New York for, to open the season. We are hard at work finalizing all the details of winter and we will be announcing part two of the season of Gather in the next week or two. So you can look for it online. It usually goes up on our Facebook, uh, Penny Stamp Series Facebook page first. Uh, but we, yeah, never fear, we'll be back. See you in 2020. Enjoy Thanksgiving and your holidays. Uh, this is also the last week of us having the gratitude campaign table in the lobby. Uh, we have students Manda Villarreal and Abby Sigin helping facilitate today. So hopefully you have letters that you've written and brought in or are thinking about them now during the talk. You can write them after. And of course you can always mail them to us or drop them off at the school as well. There, there is a book that's being put together uh, for Penny's family uh, that's going to be given to her uh, or to them in the next few weeks. So uh, if, you, if you are still holding on to letters, you know, please do try to get them to us sort of, you know, the week after Thanksgiving and, and then they'll, they'll be part of it. It'll be wonderful. Um, couple of event announcements. Uh, partnering today, the Institute for Humanities, they have an event, an opening of an exhibition tonight. Uh, so you could go over there following this. This is Detroit artist Tylon Sawyer. Uh, he's actually created a mural. He's been part of an artist residency at the Institute and he's worked on a mural depicting the first African-American student to attend the University of Michigan, which was Samuel C. Watson. This was, he was admitted to U of M in 1853 and graduated in 1857. Uh, Tylon worked with U of M students to create this mural. It is now on view in the first floor of the Modern Languages building. And then as another part of his project while here uh, is this exhibition, which is, uh, includes uh, new and existing work. It opens this evening. It runs through December 19th. There is a reception at the gallery happening tonight, uh, right after this talk till 7.30. So you should take a walk over to Thayer and check out the work and meet Tylon. Then tomorrow evening, join us at the Stamps Gallery for the opening of the Undergrad Juried Exhibition. So these, yeah, this is, these are pieces that were chosen by a very illustrious jury, I'm told. Uh, and there will be awards uh, to student work in this exhibition, which will be announced at the exhibition opening reception, which is tomorrow evening from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, there was a last minute addition today. We have some guests in the audience which, who are deaf and we will have uh, American Sign Language interpreters joining us up here on stage. Uh, yeah, and we have with us today Kara Doherty and Christina Lakey. So thank them so much for just showing up and being here for us, yes. Um, Please do remember to silence your cell phones. We are going to have our regular Q&A in the screening room today that's out the doors to the left, down the hallway, in the other smaller theater. You can come and meet Edel, ask him questions. Uh, and he also has books for sale in the lobby. Nicola's books is here. Now, these books were not written by Edel, but they are all illustrated by Edel. I just took a look at them. They're sort of beautiful and amazing. There's a book about Leonard Nimoy, one about Muhammad Ali, one about Sonia Sotomayor. So 
Check them out. If you do buy one and you want to get it signed, come to the Q&A, and at the end of the Q&A, Edel will uh, be happy to meet folks in the lobby outside the screening room and sign a few books. So now, a few words about the background of our guest. Edel Rodriguez is a Cuban-American artist inspired by personal history, religious rituals, politics, memory, and nostalgia. His bold, Figurative works are an examination of identity, mortality, and cultural displacement. He uses a variety of materials, and his work ranges from the conceptual to portraiture and landscape. He is a regular contributor to the New York Times op-ed page and The New Yorker. He's created over 100 newspaper and magazine covers for clients such as Time, Der Spiegel, Newsweek, The Nation, Business Week, The New Republic, and The Village Voice. He's created dozens of book covers for clients such as Simon & Schuster and Penguin Random House, uh, and also created several stamps for the US Postal Service, an illustrated poster and advertising campaigns for operas, films, Broadway shows, and most recently, uh, he worked with the band U2 on their uh, touring stage production. Uh, Edel's artwork has been exhibited internationally and is in the collections of a variety of institutions, including the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and numerous private collections. His work has received many awards from the Art Directors Club and the Society of Illustrators in New York City. Uh, and we're going to begin, actually, with a film, a brief film uh, of, that is uh, about Edel's current work, and then Edel will join us on stage. So, enjoy. Let me make sure I can get it to work. Good morning, I'm Richard Hake. 618, 35 degrees right now in New York. My name is Idel Rodriguez. I'm an artist. I'm originally from uh, Havana, Cuba. I grew up in a small town called El Gabriel, about an hour south of Havana. I came here during the Maria boat lift in 1980. The governor of Texas, Bill Clement, says the president has literally opened the floodgates, placing no limitations on the number of Cubans entering the United States. The downside of it was really my family missing who we left behind. There was a lot of um, anxiety and angst about family. And at that time, we didn't really know when we would see them again. And that was scary and, and very difficult. And then I didn't return to Cuba until 1994. That was a big shock, you know, because 14 years later, I arrived in Cuba, and it was 10 times worse than how we had left. That's when it, it hit me, wow, uh, my life really did change completely because my parents took this, this turn, this decision to leave. This is a, this is a series of, of um, actually Cuban science fiction books that I've been doing. So they're trying to introduce Cuban science fiction into the United States because Cuban science fiction um, does a lot of things where they, they hide and they, they, they talk about what's happening in society but through science fiction. And they did that through the 80s and 90s. And uh, it's getting picked up here in the United States. So they asked me to do the covers for it. I drew for fun as a kid, you know, not that seriously. But uh, when I arrived in the US, it became kind of like a communication tool sometimes. Like uh, if I didn't know how to say something, I would draw it for my teacher or for someone in class. But this is a map of the United States. So as you can see, Texas, Florida. So it's a map inside about 10 or 15 cigar boxes. I grew up with my grandfather smoking cigars, so I like, uh, I just like to have that feels. I like the, the smell that comes from the boxes. And sometimes I use them for my artwork. And this was a map that I was asked to do by Amtrak. Coloring is something that I always had in my work that I think just came from my culture and my background. The colors that I used were very strong and uh, very saturated. I never thought about it. That's just the way I see things. That's the way I do things. Studying fine arts, you're not told what to do. You're told you have to figure out what you want to paint. And then that's when you start thinking more about your identity where you come from, where you might get ideas from. And that's when I started thinking more about uh, Cuba and using it in my artwork. On my work, I'm very aggressive and very direct. I'm not going to sit back and just accept what's happening. I'm gonna fight with what I have right now, which is my work. 
Mark, you're looking at live pictures out of Charlottesville, Virginia. This is where violent clashes have broken out between white nationalists and counter protests there. You had a lot of people in that group that were there to innocently protest and very legally protest because, you know, I don't know if you know, they had a permit. The other group didn't have a permit. This was most recently on the events in Charlottesville. I had shown him with a, a KKK hood in the past, and every time I did it, I'm like, oh, am I going too far? Oh, let's see. But at this moment, I was like, no, I'm like that's it. He is a racist. I'm going to put the hood on. And I sent it to the editor of Der Spiegel, and they agreed. And, uh, you know, they called it um, the, the true face of Donald Trump. The same week, I was hired by Time Magazine to do one on the same story. This uh, image of um, a neo-Nazi with the American flag, this was all, all over the press as well. When it's on the cover of Time Magazine, you have to talk about it. It sits on your coffee table at your family's house for a week. You see it on a newsstand. You have to talk to your kids about this when this shows up. So that's why I do strong coverage, because I want people to have conversations. And that's the point of magazine covers, is to start conversations and get people to deal with the facts. When you're, you're, when you're printing, you come up with some really like fine prints, mm -hmm. and those I, I, I sell to people that want to collect them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the process, you come up with really junky. <laughs> and then these I, I, I put up on the streets. You know, there's mistakes, all sorts of things that happen in the process. I'm always fascinated about how people deal with art in different contexts. So from a museum to a street to a magazine cover to a painting to online. I do things in the city and environment sometimes. I like the interaction. I like getting things out of the studio and I like getting things off magazine covers and seeing how the world deals with it in a different format. These are all different venues that, that our work can be shown and shared. Once you go out to the street and you start putting up a poster, you're sometimes surrounded by people immediately and you have live conversations about what you're doing. That's fun to me, and seeing how my work interacts with other things in the wall or with the environment. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just put it there like two hours ago. I'm gonna give you these two also. All right. That is so fresh. So I like I like to see what happens with my images once they get out. I'd definitely like to do more of that and see what happens when people kind of interact with them. We're here at uh, Copa Union, and this is the, uh, an exhibit that I'm in uh, um, called uh, We the People. It's about the Constitution, and I was uh, asked to create a poster on the 10th Amendment, and that's it, down there. So there's gonna be one, an opening here tonight. The current uh, exhibit is put together by a, a, a design firm called Thought Matter. They asked these 10 designers to create a poster campaign. And it's sort of a visual way for people to learn about these amendments on the street, uh, street posters. Yeah, thank you very One much. Yeah. yeah, they have great space here. Yeah. Your, your, both of your work. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> really make this come alive. They pulled off uh, randomly what amendment you were going to do. And I was given the 10th amendment. And uh, graphically, for me, the X of 10 was very strong. So I like that image of the X. And I created hindsight of fighting, but they're also being tied down a bit. And the, the amendment states that anything that's not written in the Constitution goes back to the states or to the people. I have things inside of me that I'm trying to get out all the time. 
trying to match what's in my head to what's on the paper to me is a really interesting challenge. If you're an artist, it's something that you're always going to be obsessed about. Years ago, someone asked me what I did for fun and I said drawing. Sometimes people will say, oh, that's, that, that's your soul or that's, your, that's you. And I said, no, it's actually, it's something that I made and it's, it's sort of a reflection of what's on my mind, but it's not totally what's really on my mind. Thank you, uh, Michigan, for um, uh, inviting me here. Um, it's wonderful to be in this part of the country. It's my first time in, uh, in Ann Arbor, and i um, looking forward to talking about my work and some of the inspiration uh, behind it. Um, here are uh, some photographs of uh, when I was a kid in Cuba. Um, I grew up there. I was born in 1971 and grew up there in the 70s. This is about 10 years um, after the revolution. And all the kids were very fascinated with the revolution, the, the, the way you dress. This is me in my school uniform with sort of my Che Guevara hat. Uh, this is in my, my uncle's uh, military uniform. And you know, when you're a kid, soldiers and things of that sort are very um, influential. So I, I, I became very fascinated with the graphics of the revolution at that time. These are some of the other graphics that were in my, around my town. In my, um, I lived in a small town and we're surrounded by billboards, graphics, things promoting the revolution, um, slogans. Uh, this slogan, for example, uh, says, uh, means socialism or death. So as a child, when you're looking at this kind of propaganda, it does have a pretty uh, big effect on you. Uh, but one of the things that happened, my father over here, pretty much Elvis, uh, <laughs> He was really into Elvis Presley in Cuba. So he was, he was, as you can tell from this picture, he was always against the grain, going against what was happening in Cuba. He didn't like the dictatorship, he didn't like um, the party, and he would do things to kind of taunt, taunt them in, in a way. One of the things he did is he got his hands on foreign uh, magazines from, from Germany, and he pulled out all the advertising from the magazines and wallpapered the entire back of our house with ads. So if you look behind us, those are all um, uh, ads that he wallpapered around our house. And he was the town photographer, so he would have people come from town to take pictures of themselves in front of this wall that he created. Sort of like, we can't have this stuff because we live in communism, but we can take pictures in front of it. And a lot of my birthday pictures and things of that sort were taken in front of this wall. But I remember being, it was the first time that I noticed graphic design, advertising, illustration, was on this wall in the back of my house. This is my family and my, um, my family's farm. My grandfather uh, was a farmer. Um, my mom is one of eight children. And we would gather there um, about once a month to have a, a family get together, a family party. Uh, but what's interesting about this photograph is that um, within a year of this photograph getting, uh, being taken, about half the people had left Cuba. And um, I think right now, there's only maybe two that are still in Cuba. Um, part of the reason that, uh, that part of the, 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 what was happening in the 70s is that um, the dictatorship and the, 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 the oppression in Cuba had become to such degree that if you were not within the revolution, you could not live there. The, their slogan was, within the revolution, everything, outside the revolution, nothing. So if you did anything, to oppose the revolution or criticize it. You were banned from work, uh, you could not go to school, things of that sort. My, um, my parents did not want to raise their kids in that uh, environment, so they were trying to find ways to leave the country. And one of the things that, that came up was something called the Mariel Boat Lift, uh, which was this organized boat lift of Cubans that wanted to leave the island. Um, Castro um, said, you know, if you want to leave, we don't want you, you're scum, get out of this country. 
um, we, you know, we don't need you basically. So um, this, this whole trip got arranged with my family in the United States. They went to pick us up and we boarded a boat on um, the, uh, April 30th of 1980 and arrived in, in Florida in Key West on May 1st of 1980. That's me over there in the little red jacket. My father is behind us. Those guys are likely political prisoners <laughs> or who knows what. Uh, one of the things that Castro did was empty out his jails um, on the boats. So he, there were about 25 family members, but about 50 other people that we did not know. And they may, may, mostly came from prisoners, insane asylums. Uh, there were prostitutes, um, er, basically anyone that, that Castro deemed undesirable and he wanted out of the country. Uh, and this is my, my family over here uh, that same night. This is a shot that a photographer took um, of me on the boat. And as you, as, as you probably know, when you leave a country, you don't bring a photo crew with you. Uh, one of the things that happened that there were, there were photographers in Cuba um, documenting this, um, this boat lift, uh, but Castro threw them out of the country too. He didn't want American photographers documenting what was happening. And when he threw out about 10 journalists and photographers, the, the way they were, their transportation out that night was our boat. <laughs> so our boat was one of the most documented boats of, of that boat lift. And um, I think it was about uh, 14 years later, this is, this is in 1980, 14 years later in 1994, I started working at Time Magazine. And I was curious, you know, how, how did Time Magazine cover uh, the boat lift of 1980. So I went up to the library and started uh, snooping around and I found a story that was written by a reporter that was on my boat. <laughs> so one thing leads to another. Um, they set me up to do a photo shoot with a photographer because the, the magazine wanted to do a story about this story. <laughs> and in the middle of the photo shoot, the photographer looks at me and goes, I think I've seen, I've seen you, I recognize your eyes. <laughs> from 1980. I was on a boat on 1980 on May 1st too. <laughs> I think I have pictures of your family. So he went back to his studio and he went through all his slides and the next day he brought me about 20 photographs of my family on the boat, which is the photos that you guys just saw here. So it's kind of strange how life uh, goes full circle. So overnight, you know, from April 30th, 1980 to May 1st, 1980, I went from this kind of graphics to this kind of graphics. So for a kid, this is the kind of thing that happens in your brain. These things become the same thing. You know, revolutionaries become rock stars and, and rock stars become revolutionaries. So the graphics of America had a secondary influence on me after the revolution, as you can see. <laughs> So uh, we were young kids and um, they were, my family in Miami always had great salsa parties. Um, and the one thing we would say is you can have your salsa party, but we need to rock out. <laughs> so we, me and my cousins would, would paint all these instruments. We'd make our own, um, drum sets out of cardboard. I painted that whole kiss down there and we get in full costume and do a rock show for our Latin family. And not much, you know, this is my studio right now. So not much has changed. <laughs> As you can see, I'm still painting on boxes that I find in the trash. Um, I've created large sculptures out of these boxes, environments, uh, paintings. So my studio is full of a lot of different activities. One of the things when I was in college is I was always told, I went to Pratt Institute in New York, I was told, you have to pick a focus. What are you, a painter? Are you a designer? Are you an illustrator? And I'm like, I don't know, I like it all. And you're always pressured to choose, to make a decision about who you are. And I didn't choose. I just decided to continue doing everything. And for the past 25 years, I've done everything. I've done sculpture, design, illustration, and it's kept me busy and, uh, and going with a, an ongoing career for this many years. These are some of the paintings that I create in my studio. Uh, this is work. Uh, all the brown in this work is done with uh, coffee. These are some other paintings. Sometimes I get really interested in the idea of following through with a certain look or a certain technique. In this case, is I wanted every line to be made of little white dots, almost like uh, images that you see in outer space. 
So I, I run through a, a series for about two or three months and I, I move on to the next series. This one was the idea that we're all kind of made of particles or um, sort of dots and I was trying to create faces out of this combination. This is more influenced by African, uh, Afro-Cuban imagery of Santeria and things of that sort. And this gives you an idea of my thought process. So this is what the initial sketch looks like. <laughs> it's just get it out of your head as soon as possible. Put it down, put it down. That's what I tell my students. If you have an idea, put it on paper. Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't make a note about it. Just sketch whatever is on your head at the time. Text, ideas. And, and the idea that was here that I had was to create a sculpture out of boxes that intertwined brands you know, uh, corporate brands, terrorism, politics, all in one complete um, installation. I feel that in what's happening in this country a lot is that brands have, have become the facilitators of um, very bad things that are happening. This is a follow-up sketch in pencil. You know, we, we buy guns at Walmart and uh, uh, other sporting goods stores. Uh, we've got American Airlines is, is taking immigrant kids from one state to the other. So I, I got into this idea of creating um, a little bit of a, a collection of everything that's happening in America right now in a giant uh, installation. These are some close-ups of, um, of the, the installation. That's just the Costco logo, <laughs> reworked a bit. <laughs> send letters to the administration. <laughs> um, these are more, uh, you know, FedEx is, uh, FedEx was, uh, uh, there was a controversy over FedEx giving uh, discounts to uh, gun um, uh, companies for delivering. But at the same time, you know, we have terrorism, so many things happening, so. And then here's a sample of some of my book covers. This was a series that I did for um, uh, a Cuban science fiction writer. And this was a series of 10 book covers that I did for Chino Achebe, an African author. Um, the book in the middle is, is required reading in a lot of high schools now. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so my, uh, with the funny story with that is that my nephew was in Miami reading that book and my mom saw it and she just grabbed it, called me, and she said, Idel, what is your painting doing on this book? Because <laughs> she had seen the painting in my studio. And I said, well, I, they, I, they asked me to do the book cover. And she's like, no, 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 no. But this, the painting that was in your studio, it's on this book. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> so, <laughs> mom. Uh, but the thing that I've gotten mostly known lately for it are magazine covers. I've done about 150 magazine covers. Here are some of them. Uh, here's one on Mao. Um, the one on the right was done uh, when they, uh, they killed Osama bin Laden. That, as an example, I had to do that in about a day and a half uh, for Newsweek magazine. Um, they, uh, it was happened on Sunday, and it, it had to be out by Tuesday, so... The first time that I noticed a magazine cover could have a lot of impact was when I did this cover for Communication Arts. Um, they were doing a special issue on Cuban design, and this idea popped into my head, the, what was happening with the image of Che, how Che had become a brand, how we were trying to be as um, sort of rebellious and revolutionary as Che, but Che itself in Cuba was becoming a brand. If you go to Cuba, you can buy Che wallets, which is kind of ironic. Uh, Che shirts. It was, it was pretty disgusting when you go there. You're like, wait, what's going on here? So I decided to just take these two things and put them together. The Apple, um, I was, uh, when I was leaving to Cuba in the past, when I, when I traveled to see my family in Cuba, they would ask me for medicine, um, food, things of that sort. Um, and then in 2006, when I told them I was going, going to go down there, they, they, they said, can you bring us sneakers and uh, can they be Nike sneakers? <laughs> And we liked some, you know, an iPod. And I was like, wait a second, you guys used to ask for food. <laughs> so I started seeing how branding and, and brands have become very powerful. So I did this cover and it became a, a very um, big cover worldwide. It started a lot of discussions at that time on blogs. Um, 
It's the highest selling magazine issue that, that Communication Arts has done. And um, also it ended up in Cuba. Um, doing this to Cuba, uh, to Che Ch in Cuba is very dangerous, very complicated. So people that I met later on told me that they would just put it in a paper bag and like pass it around <laughs> to their friends because they could not show this in public. <coughs> Another project that I started doing was a project on, in 2014 on ISIS. I started seeing how ISIS was kind of taking over territory, and it was a story that I didn't think people were really paying attention to. So I decided to create images and put them online. Um, they became these viral images. About every week I would put up an image, and it was shared widely on Twitter, on Facebook, on social media. And I wanted to take um, a story that we were ignoring, and if you, if you take image and do very powerful um, imagery, perhaps this will wake people up and make them see, well, we got to pay attention to this. What's going on here? Um, so I'd create these kinds of images, um, uh, and then I created a poster campaign around it, and I began to put posters around New York City. This image, for example, proves my point. <laughs> that there's all this happening behind this guy and, and he wasn't even paying attention to it. He was watching a movie on his cell phone. Um, he was there for half an hour, people coming and going as if uh, that wasn't, so um, I like this combination. I like seeing what happens with people, posters and photography at the same time. But then <laughs> in 2016 or so, I started seeing what was happening in this country and seeing the similarities of extremism between one side and the other. Uh, yes, going from there to here is, is a stretch, but well, in 2016 it was a stretch, but in 2019 when we have white supremacists and shoot, shooting people in, in, in Texas at a Walmart, that stretch is not that far apart anymore. And for me what happened was that uh, I got to a point where I didn't think ISIS was a real danger to me here, but that uh, white supremacy was the biggest, bigger danger to my, to my life and my, my family. So I started making images about that. And then in 2016, we had an election. <laughs> so, um, well, what I saw in, 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 in Trump as a candidate was uh, from, from what I had experienced in Cuba and the type of language that uh, Fidel Castro used, where Castro would abuse people, mock them, uh, tell them to leave the country if they didn't like the country. Um, these are the same things that, that Trump was saying as a candidate, and it freaked me out. I said, well, you know, I know what this is, but Maybe Americans don't know what this is about, but I, I could see that sort of dictatorship mentality in, in this candidate. So I started making image, images uh, of, of Trump like before the, the, the primaries, and I would put, put them online on my social media feeds. But first I had to create a character of Trump. So this was my, my kind of rendering of how, what I thought um, I could, uh, uh, the way I could communicate Trump in a very direct way. No eyes, so that you wouldn't focus on, on the eyes, you would focus more on the mouth and, and the attitude. Uh, I wanted to simplify the colors, so I went with orange, yellow, red, and black for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, and the idea was to create a brand, a brand that anytime you saw this pop up on your social media feeds or on a magazine cover, you'd recognize right away who and what I was talking about. Um, when you look at a, uh, when you're driving and you see a, a, a danger sign or a caution sign, what color is it? Orange, okay? So I started using orange as this color that was very strong and got your attention. So that was the point. I put a lot of my images up online on social media, hoping that magazines would kind of hire me to do it. <laughs> and um, having a history in magazines, I understand that what magazines try to do is cover both sides equally. But I thought that was, this was not a time to be equal, that there, there was a, a much bigger danger that was happening. So I created uh, this character, and after it was online for a while, Time Magazine called me and asked me to create a cover for them. So this is a cover that I did in 2016, about two months before the election in the summer. It was very hot, and Trump was hotter. <laughs> So uh, we all came up with the idea of, of his face melting down and, and you know, they asked me, you think you can pull that off? I'm like, yeah, sure, I got it. 
So I put this, uh, um, this got published and it was immediately a big uh, sensation. Then two months later, uh, two weeks before the election, he came out and said, uh, the video came out where he said he liked to grab women by the, you know what? <laughs> so um, they asked me to create a sort of a, um, a sequel <laughs> cover, which I had never done. And this was it. Anyways, both of these covers ended up everywhere. Um, on, on television, here's on MSNBC. That guy up there is a, was a waiter at a restaurant in New York City and he just drew it on his menu board. <laughs> uh, on the left is a woman painted it on her fingernails and emailed me the picture. Um, so it, it just became a very big sensation. Uh, I think it was about a week left before the election and I, and I said, well, this is such a, a sensation. I gotta take this further. <laughs> So I created about a hundred of these posters uh, by hand, stencil art, and I started um, uh, uh, pasting them up around New York City. Um, that's in Times Square over there. Uh, this is at the, at the Trump International Building Hotel. <laughs> uh, I just went there at like 11 o'clock at night and left it on the coffee table in the lobby and got the hell out of there. I just, I would love to see the face of whoever came across that at the Trump Hotel. Um, Times Square. Um, the best part of this photograph is that everyone under those masks are from Mexico. <laughs> and they usually charge like two or three dollars and they're like, no, lo hacemos gratis. They're like, no, we won't charge you anything. Yeah, we love it. They were laughing, they were really enjoying uh, the whole thing. Uh, but what happened was he won, he won the election. So um, that went down. <laughs> and then um, in January, January 21st, the week of January 21st, his first week, the first thing that Trump decided to do was establish the Muslim ban. Um, and um, what happened is he decided, you know, he declared that no Muslims can enter the United States. I thought that was one of the most racist things that any president has ever done. Um, what really upset me was seeing news stories that there were little kids flying from Iran and all these countries coming sometimes by themselves to, to visit family here and they were trapped at immigration. They were not allowed to come in. Grandmothers from other Islamic countries that were coming here to have an operation. There were so many stories that were coming out of the, these airports. Um, and I got really angry and I literally just took one of those terrorist images that I had made and put Trump's head on it and the Statue of Liberty. And I put that online. So I put this image online. And it went very viral right away uh, everywhere on its own. Then about um, five days later, four or five days later, there's Spiegel, a German magazine that, that um, was doing a story on the Muslim ban and they, they called me to do a cover, but none of my sketches were working. They didn't like what I was doing. So they just went into my Twitter feed and they said, hey, we saw this thing on your Twitter. Can we publish that? And I was like, I don't know, can you? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we love it. We really like it. We want you to just put a suit on him and uh, we're gonna go with it. And I was just kind of freaked out that they even wanted to publish that, but they did. <laughs> So this came out on a Friday night um, online, on Der Spiegel's uh, um, online feeds. It, turned, it came out Friday night around 6 p.m. And it hadn't even been published in print yet, just online. And the next morning, people had printed out the image from the internet and created giant posters to bring to protests. So this was at a protest at the Stonewall um, Inn Bar in New York City. Uh, this was a guy in San Francisco, and these, these images just started showing up online. In, I don't know how I came across them. Sometimes uh, people sent them to me, sometimes just they would at me on Twitter or something. Um, this is a woman in Denver at a protest, and it really galvanized a lot of um, sort of energy against uh, what the president was doing. So then overnight, 
uh, it goes from you know uh, me covering the story to me being the story. <laughs> Part of the reason is the media. One of the um, you know w within like five or ten minutes of that that cover being published, I got a call from the Washington Post and from BuzzFeed, and the BuzzFeed reporter was like, "So that cover, did you do that?" <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, that, I did that," and she was kind of just. I could sense in her voice she was freaked out. And, I, and the thing with me is that I, I work with this imagery all the time in my work, so I didn't think much of it. I was like, hey, it's just a guy covering someone's head off. <laughs> but to the media, it was a big shock, you know, that you would show the president that way. So they, I had CNN in my studio, uh, MSNBC, a bunch of other, I mean, it was like three months of, of media from all over the world, from Greece, Mexico, everywhere. Um, this is uh, the guy from Univision, the Spanish, uh, Jorge Ramos, um, and uh, I'm Trump's most hated artist. <laughs> Yay! Um, so this is some of uh, some media at my shows. Uh, this was a, a TV show. I got invited to Germany. I've been to Germany about five or six times to to do be on television, have exhibits and things like that. This is a Dutch Well Television. But I also made friends. <laughs> I made so many new friends. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I still get, get these from people, like uh, this and that and the other. This guy asked me if I was illegal. I've been, here for, I've been here for almost 40 years, and I've never been asked this question, OK? I've never, I've never heard the things that I've heard from people, from strangers online. I get direct emails, threats, and all sorts of things. Um, here's a good one. <laughs> Fidel, you're a pathetic traitor to the United States. I should have been hung? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Rock on, asshole. <laughs> so that was my favorite part. So I, I've actually been saving these in my hate mail folder. So I have a whole thing of hate mail and I'm gonna make everybody famous when I publish my book. <laughs> you gotta do something with this stuff. Um, here's more. Um, uh, what happened is that Der Spiegel cover was so successful. It, 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 what happened, in, you know, I went to Der Spiegel's offices and they have a whole tracking of their magazine covers, sales and interest, and it's all like this. And then whenever they would publish one of my covers, it would go up, you know? So they're like, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's publish more of this. And it was exciting for me because I was like, wow, okay, being direct, honest, and straightforward and telling like it is, is getting viewership, it's getting interest, and it's getting published. Yeah. So um, this is one cover, uh, it's called Deadly Game, about uh, Trump in North Korea, this one. <laughs> and, and I was like, I'm gonna do this, no one's ever gonna publish this, and like, Der Spiegel published it. <laughs> I'm always in shock. But that's the, one of the things I've learned is make the work and see where it goes. Make the work and the rest follows. This one. I don't know what was happening here. It was, uh, it was like, wow, he had been stripped of everything. He, he you know, it was at a point where, um, what's he gonna do next or something? But this was like two years ago. And uh, <laughs> so I did this. The funny thing is, I put it on uh, online and my mom called me right away. <laughs> and I'm like, hello. Uh, Edel, ¿qué tú haces? Tú eres un artista barato which means, when did you become a cheap artist? <laughs> so I hung up on her, and, uh, and I unfriended her. <laughs> and then I revised the image, and uh, called my mom back up, and I told her, hey, I, uh, I, I fixed it. So um, I've unfriended my mom about three or four times now. But then we always make up. Um, I was walking in my neighborhood and saw a sign, <laughs> saw an, a no pooping sign, and then I started seeing Trump everywhere. That became a problem, but also a good thing. So I did that one. I want to make this into little signs and leave them in the grass in New York City. 
like little silkscreen plastic signs and said, curb your Trump. <laughs> this is another idea. So uh, I wanted to make these stickers and just show up at the, at the supermarket and just put them on peaches. And I'm, I'm working with a, a, a peach company to do so. Um, the idea here was, okay, so I've established the whole graphic language. How far can I push this? And I keep stretching things to try to see, are people going to recognize it? And I'm surprised, like, how many people recognize what's happening here. So um, that's one of my favorite images. And then this is on um, a little take on Goya and what's happening to uh, the children at the border. They're, they're just being eaten up by the system. So this is the one cover that Donald Trump Jr. posted online and said, that's right, Time Magazine. That's what we're trying to do to America. We want to destroy it. So there you go. <laughs> he actually said that. We want to bring down the system. Uh, here are the covers on, uh, from Charlottesville. Uh, in one week, I, was, I, I was, did both covers for Time and, and Der Spiegel. And then again, I did a whole series of posters that uh, were set up, uh, I would put up around New York City. Fine. See if you can find it. <laughs> <laughs> so this was on Broadway. I tried to sneak in the poster. It was there for like two weeks. No one noticed it. <laughs> and then... I just love the Tide logo, and I wanted to do something with it. And again, mom <laughs> calls me, Edel, how did you get those boxes in that store? I'm like, mom, it's Photoshop. But so I take ideas, push them as much as I can and as far as I can. Uh, this is a good example. So for one cover, I've got here, I think, about 20 different sketches, 20-something sketches. Uh, this is on a one-year anniversary, and um, we ended up going with this sketch down here. But then all the other ideas still stay in the, in the mix for who knows what, what comes next. This is a guy that owns a store in, in New York City. <laughs> So people sometimes ask me, reporters ask me, like, how far will you go? And, uh, and I actually draw lines for myself. You know, I don't want to, you know, insult. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do anything too sexual sometimes, things like that. I, like him kissing Putin, it's a joke on homosexuality. Why do that? And, uh, so I do draw some lines. And uh, one of the images that I had done was this image, and I held on to it. I was like, well, that would be showing him as an orangutan. That's not good. <laughs> I'll get in trouble, whatever. So I held on to it, and then a year later, their Spiegel was asking me for sketches. I sent a bunch of things. Nothing was working, and he challenged me. The editor's like, come on, you can do better than this. I want you to go further. I go, okay, I got something. And I sent this to him after holding it for a year, and he's like, I love it. Go figure. And then the other thing is people have told me that this is going to ruin my career. No company is going to want to work with me, blah, 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 blah. So I, uh, this company in England that does um, renewable energy wanted my work on billboards. <laughs> so this is a billboard. They did a whole campaign with my work. Um, this is Trump burning. Re renewable is unstoppable. Um, this is what that one looks in the, in the London tube. So as the train's passing by, you see this? And then uh, the last part of it here is the, uh, is the protest, how people, people have downloaded this stuff from online. Before a protest, I upload all my work and I tell people they can download it for free, print whatever they want, I don't care. Uh, send me pictures if you can. So a lot of times I, take, I get pictures from people. This little kid painted one of my 
um, covers for a, a, a poster at the Women's March. Um, <clears throat> that's another one that I that had created. Uh, this is actually Michael Beirut's uh, wife. Um, she loves my work and took it to a protest. Uh, and this is a lot more pictures from various uh, people using. So you can see the same how the same images have different kind of lives. They can be used in different ways. And then here are some exhibits that I've had. So this is in Portland at the Wyden Kennedy uh, headquarters. Oh, <laughs> I forgot. So White and Kennedy people ask me, is there anything you want to do that you haven't done yet? I'm like, yeah, I want to do a piñata. <laughs> and they're like, that's amazing. We're going to do it. Best part, they hired a Peruvian nanny <laughs> that makes piñatas to make this piñata. So it was about six feet tall, and they hung it in the middle of the gallery during the show. And, um, and then they asked me, well, what do you want to fill it with? And I'm like, of course, Cheetos. <laughs> it was a big freaking Cheeto mess. Um, yeah, we, 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 we bashed it all up at the end of the show. It was covered on CNN and everything. This, that little kid was eating Cheetos off the floor. Um... Oh, this is the, uh, the impeachment cover that came out back in April. <clears throat> and then this is the last cover I did, which was he's painted himself into a corner with, it, with his own orange paint. And then this image uh, is, a, is a photo that I took after I pasted this, um, this uh, poster in New York City. So I was in the Lower East Side of New York City pasting cover uh, posters on, on walls. And I pasted this one. <clears throat> I went to another wall, and when I was there, a bunch of guys were coming, you know, walking on the sidewalk, dressed uh, like knit caps and regular clothes and stuff. And they're like, hey, man, this is cool. What you doing? And I'm like, I'm posting posters. And like, we're the police. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they were undercover cops. There were about five of them. And they showed me their ID, and they're like, we need your ID. This is illegal. You can't be posting posters. And I, and I said, what, on that wall? It's full of graffiti and other posters. Yeah, it's against the law. It's a private wall. Uh, every wall in New York City is private property, so you can't do this. So they took my ID. They ran me for, you know, they checked me to see if I had any uh, warrants or whatever. And then, um, they, I, you know, showing them my, like, you know, school of arts ID. I was trying to do as much as possible so I wouldn't get arrested. Because, you know, I'm Hispanic. <laughs> so I don't want to get arrested. So um, once I'm done, and they're like, okay, we're going to let you go, but you can't do this anymore. So I'm packing up my posters as I'm, as I'm leaving. One of the cops says, hey, can I, can I have one of those? <laughs> and I was like, are you serious? We're doing this? He's like, yeah, I like it. I want to put it up at the precinct. Yeah, I swear. And I'm, I'm grabbing one. He's like, no, give me one without the wheat paste. Just give me a fresh one because I want to put it up. I was like, okay. And then as I'm giving it, he's like, can you sign it for me? And I was like, no, I'm not signing it, man. We're good. So I got out of there. But the good part of the story is that if, if the cops are asking you for signed posters <laughs> of this, we're not in the dictatorship yet. <laughs> so. Yeah. Which brings me to this. This was just said a couple days ago, and when I heard this, I was driving the car and I was listening to the impeachment hearings on the radio, and uh, Vindman said this. I, I started welling up, crying. I had to pull over, because this is the thing that I tell my father every time I see my father, okay? I say, Dad, you know, that I'm sitting here today in the U.S. Capitol is proof that you made the right decision 40 years ago to leave the Soviet Union, come to America in search of a better life for our family. Do not worry. I will be fine telling the truth. I've been warned by my family so many times to stop doing what I'm doing. And this is what I tell them. I said, no, this is the reason you brought me here, to speak. 
Okay, and if I don't speak, I'm not um, honoring what you what you guys did. So to hear someone at the impeachment hearings say the same thing was very powerful to me. So now, um, what's happened is all that um, all that's been going on with uh, with my work has gotten me a lot of other projects that I think uh, are are worth sharing and really interesting. Uh, the band U2 was following my work and then they were doing a whole tours um, where they were, um, uh, you know, their new tour and they wanted to get politi more political work into their show. So this is, these are, I created about a hundred posters that show up um, at arenas when the, um, when the fans get there. So what I liked about this, this project is that they were playing in the Midwest, in Kansas, uh, I think in Nebraska, Las Vegas, places that would generally not see these kinds of messages. So I, uh, I wanted to kind of go out there. This, this one, for example, this was at Madison Square Garden. Um, this was, uh, I'm not sure where this was taken. <clears throat> this is what it looks like during the show. Um, so there are posters that appear when you, when you first show up for the show and during a couple of their songs is what it looks like. And one of the coolest things that, that Bono did is he had my dad over at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> uh, and he, the whole, um, the, we were invited to do the, the warm up of the band, you know. So we, it was just me and my dad watching you two at Madison Square Garden. There's my dad right there. So after all that, that happened this summer, I um, got an opportunity to do a, a project for uh, WeTransfer. They're doing more editorial content. And one of the things that I wanted to do after everything has been done is kind of go back to the beginning, go back to where I came from, go back home. So I proposed to them that I, I wanted to go back to my hometown in Cuba and paint my friends and family and spend you know, two weeks there just focusing on that. Um, so this is uh, me. This is the the neighborhood where I uh, where I grew up in. My town. I painted. Uh, this is my godmother. Um, so I painted her in, in her garden. 
Um, and it, it was really an interesting experience because uh, when I sat her down to paint and I started painting her and every time I would take a break, um, her son is with the, um, with the, the government and, and, and her, her daughter-in-law and they were both in the house listening to, to, to basically Fox news of Cuba. Sorry. <laughs> Just very, like a lot of constant stuff. And then she, she turns to me and goes, I'm not with this. <laughs> I'm like godmother you know and she's like i respect them as humans but i don't like what's happening here and then the daughter-in-law would walk out and she would go <laughs> and so it was like this tense back and forth and that's what happens in cuba is and what i don't like sometimes actually what's happening here is that we're all americans but sometimes we are don't talk about this in front of these so i'm here talking about whatever the hell i want and if you don't like it sorry i love you um, here's my uh, next door neighbor, Nilda. Um, this is my cousin and my best friend, Yeyo. And at the end of the two weeks, I had an exhibit on my front porch, uh, the porch where I grew up on, and invited the uh, people from town to come check it out. This is my third grade teacher, Clara. And one of the interesting stories about her that, uh, that she told me is she was supposed to leave Cuba in the same boat lift that I left on in 1980. But um, she went, she was my teacher. She somehow was able to get all the way to a boat to leave. But when it was their time to leave, the Cuban military showed up with prisoners to load up the boat with political prisoners or anybody that wanted to leave the country. And the boat captain was an American guy, and he said, I'm not bringing prisoners to the United States. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that liability. I'm not bringing prisoners. You can't put prisoners on here. So the Cuban government said, fine, you're not taking prisoners, you're not taking anyone, and pulled my teacher and other people out, out of the boat, and they sent her back to my town. But then when she got back to my town, when everyone figured out that she was trying to leave the country, the communists sent people to beat her up, um, throw vegetables, eggs at her house. She was fired from uh, being a teacher and she was never be, been able to be a teacher again in Cuba for the last 40 years. So she basically sells vegetables from her front porch to make a living. And then this is how this series appears on WeTransfer. So when you go to the website, you send the file, whatever, this whole thing shows up and there's about a 10 page story that goes along with it. It's still up on, on WeTransfer right now. And all these stories that I'm telling you, that um, uh, I'm sharing, are things that I'm putting into a memoir. So right now I'm working on a 300 page graphic novel style memoir about my life in Cuba, coming to the United States and dealing with uh, what's happening um, here right now. Uh, one of the things that, um, that happened while I was in Germany after a lecture, um, there was a, group, you know, a room like this and then afterwards we took questions and, and uh, the first person to get up was an older man. He's probably about 70. And he gets up with his, tel you know, his microphone shaking, and he just asks, what's going to happen to you now? <laughs> and it freaked me out. I was like, what do you mean now? What's going to happen to you when you try to go back to America? Because he still had this idea of, of you know, uh, the war and everything. And um, what I started thinking about that, you know, this idea that you take these risks and, and, and you know, why are you doing, what's the reason for them? Um, and, but I, I always felt like if I'm not doing that, then what's the purpose of doing anything? What's the purpose of making art if I can't make what I want? And I started researching a little bit about that, like, has this been talked about before? And I found this um, Martin Luther King quote um, from uh, Alabama that um, describes a lot of what I'm feeling like and I want to share it with you. Deep down in our nonviolent creed is the conviction that there are some things so dear, some things so precious, some things so eternally true that they're worth dying for. And if a man happens to be 36 years old as I happen to be, and some great truth stands before the door of his life, some great opportunity to stand up for that which is right, 
He's afraid his home will get bombed. He's afraid that he will lose his job. He's afraid that he will get shot or beat down by state troopers. He may go on and live until he's 80. Yeah. But he's just as dead as 36 as he would be at 80. And the cessation of breathing in his life is merely the belated announcement of an earlier death of the spirit. He died. when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. Yes. Yes. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. Yes. A man dies when he refuses to take a stand for that which is true. Yes. So we're going to stand up right here amid horses. Yes. We're going to stand up right here in Alabama amid the billy club. We're going to stand up right here in Alabama amid police dogs if they have them. We're going to stand up amid tear gas. Yeah. We're going to stand up amid anything that they can muster up, yeah. letting the world know yeah. that we are determined to be free. Thank you.